Let's pray together. Father God, we, we come to you right now. And Lord, I thank you that um, by your grace, by your mercy, uh, we gather not just into this building, but into your presence. Father, I just pray that here in, in these few moments as we open up your word, that you will fulfill what you have already promised you would do in your word, and that is that you would reveal us. You would reveal yourself, and you would reveal who we really are. That your word would divide joint and marrow, revealing the intentions of our hearts. And Father, as we've come in with so many things happening in our lives, uh, things to celebrate, things that we weeped over, we've come to you. And Father, I pray that we leave here changed by you. Lord, bless us in these few moments as we open up your word to hear from you and you alone. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, I want to encourage you to open them with me, if you will, over to Philippians chapter 4. We're, we're just a few more weeks together as we've been working through uh, this letter to the Philippian church from Paul, who's writing to them from, from prison. And, and the verses we're looking at this morning, verses 9 and 8, I think are, are really just incredibly powerful verses. They've been incredibly powerful in my life, and, and, and the Lord has allowed me opportunities to speak them into others' lives and, and is dealing with, with crises and uncertainty and doubt and, and not knowing what to do in situations. In Philippians chapter 4, verses uh, beginning verses 8 and 9. Uh, and while, while you're turning there, which I think you're probably already there by now, I, I do want to encourage you to take time out out as much as you can. We were all busy lives. Sean and I were talking this morning, just kind of going over our schedule for the week. How are we going to get where we're going to get and what we're going to do is what we got to do and why do we sign up for so much stuff and how are we going to do all these things? And, uh, but I, and I know I'm, I'm saying this because I know you're doing the same thing. You're thinking, what in the world have I done? Um, so, but I want to encourage you as much as you can to, to make time out to attend our revival services here uh, tonight, Monday, and Tuesday. Uh, a revival, as remind, I was reminded this last week and coming across a quote, that revival is one of those things that happens in our lives that changes the status quo of our lives. Uh, it's a time we schedule, we block out days for, but it's a time that we've been praying, I've been praying for months, uh, that the Lord will, will work and move in us in a new and fresh way. Uh, we've been titling these three uh, meeting sets as uh, Multiply, Living a Big Impact Life. And in my prayer is that the Lord will use this time that we have uh, set aside as we seek Him uh, to not only change us, but help us to impact those He's placed us in. And so our lives are lived much beyond ourselves. Uh, we tried, uh, was hoping we'd have some kind of connection tonight. Uh, Jonathan is a, a fantastic young man. I say young man because he's younger than I am. Um, Jonathan's a great guy. Uh, but here's part of Jonathan's story. He's going to share it this evening. The Lord in his life didn't always seek the Lord. Uh, like a lot of us, God was the last thing on his mind. Uh, he found, he had, born in the United States, was lived in, a lot of his life in Japan, and found at a young age, found himself in a Japanese, backseat of a Japanese police car uh, after living in his, a gang life in Japan. And God has used him in a pretty dramatic way. And so I really want to encourage you to carve out time as much as you're able to be here the next couple of nights beginning this evening. And if you're not able to be with us, for whatever reason, I covet your prayers. Pray that the Lord will use these days in a powerful way to encourage us, challenge us, and break the status quo up of our own lives. So this is tonight. Philippians chapter 4. Verses 8 and verses 9, I think are probably, uh, they have been in my life, uh, an incredibly powerful set of verses. You know, there, there are two of the most important questions we'll ever ask in our lives, and those questions are this, who is God and who am I? And most of us spend our entire lives trying to figure out who in the world we are. Uh, if we have, by God's grace, uh, and come to know Him through salvation, through a saving faith at, a, at any stage in our lives, and even by grace at a younger age in life, or our, our teens, 20s, 30s, 40s, uh, we've known the Lord and come to know the Lord. But most of our time we spend trying to figure out who in the world are we supposed to be. 
These words here in verses 8 and 9 are speaking to Christian people, those who have yielded their lives to Jesus Christ and trying to figure out what it means to live in Jesus Christ, to build on the foundation of Jesus Christ. But these words are here for all of us. There are two things that God is greatly concerned in in your life. One is your spiritual status. And that is if you are a saved or an unsaved person. That is if, if by grace and faith you have trusted in Jesus Christ and you know that your eternal sins have been wiped clean, you have a blank slate and you stand pure and clean before God the Father. That is that, that saved or unsaved state. Unsaved, you're separated from him for eternity, which none of us want to be that. God is exp- extremely concerned about your spiritual status saved or unsaved. And he's also concerned about your spiritual condition. Once you become a believer in Jesus Christ, God is very concerned about you growing in your faith and becoming more and more like Christ and, and demonstrating the character traits, the, the attributes, the, the, the per, not the personality, but this, the, the ways it is to live in the Lord and to walk with the Lord. God is concerned about your spiritual status and your spiritual condition. And these verses here in 8 and 9, I think are some of the most powerful verses that have been pinned down, given to us by the Lord to live and to grow in our spiritual condition, to become more and more like Christ. Listen here to verse 8 and 9 and see if they seem to to resonate with you a little bit here. Uh, Paul from prison, writing to this church, experienced persecution, says this, Finally, brothers... Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. And the God of peace will be with you. Now, just just so you know where we're going, there are three main headings coming out of these verses. You see them there kind of leaping off the pages. Think about these things, practice these things. And that last promise there at the end, and the God of peace will be with you. He starts off this section here with finally. Now, I, I know if you're looking at the pages here, you're thinking, well, he says finally, but there's a whole lot more words after him. It's like the preacher who stands up and says finally, and 20 minutes later, he's done. I mean, really, is this the finally you're actually getting to? The finally section here draws us back to a sense of, of, of a section that Paul is writing to them, a, a section the Lord has for us here about what it means as we go back to verse one of chapter four, what it means to stand firm in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the Phillips paraphrase is incredibly helpful in thinking of this, where it phrases it this way. And I have one more piece of advice for you, one more bit of counsel for you. In other words, the Lord is having Paul write these things down in the way in which he does so that he will deliver to us this piece of advice to live a life standing firm in Jesus Christ. Now remember, this particular church was living in a very unsettled time. They were being persecuted for their faith because they believed in Jesus and trusted Jesus and were sharing Jesus with anyone who would listen. They were being pressed out of the marketplace, couldn't conduct business. They were being pressed out of their culture. The people didn't want them around. They were being jailed as Paul was for their faith. They were living in a very unsettled day. You know, we can even say that in our own day, we are living in very unsettled times. We turn on the news in the evening. We catch what's happening on the news. It's very disturbing to us. We watch our Twitter feeds. We see all the the truths and have-truths and fake news coming across. We wonder what's real, what can I trust, what can I not trust? And we live in very unsettled times. Mentioned last week a survey that had been done that shows American fears are on the rise and they keep going up. We're very concerned about what are we going to do? How are we going to live? What's the future? you're going to be like? Where, how, where am I going to be? Who am I going to be in 20 years from now? We're very concerned about all these things. And Paul writing to us and, and looking at this church and loving these people with everything he has and the Lord reaching or working through him, inspiring him to write these things down. And the way he does says this, I want you to stand firm in Jesus Christ. Here's how I want you to stand firm in Jesus Christ. I want you to think about this and I want you to practice this. I need you to think about these things, practice these things. I want you to dwell on these things. I want you to act on these things. 
He says here, thinking about these things. This idea of thinking uh, comes to us from a, a sense of thinking deeply, of dwelling upon it, of pondering over it again and again and again. Uh, it reminds me here of the, uh, the, Chris, the movie The Christmas Story with Ralphie and the Red Rider BB gun. You remember The Christmas Story? Yeah, I remember watching it with my kids and thinking, why am I letting my kids watch this movie? I loved it as a kid, but I had no idea all this stuff was in it. But remember, if you remember the, the movie, Ralphie wants a Red Rider BB gun. That's all he wants. His essay he writes to his first teacher is about getting a Red Rider BB gun. He, he goes to see Santa at the mall because he wants a Red Rider BB gun. Every time his parents ask him, what do you want for Christmas? I want a Red Rider BB gun, not a pink bunny suit. I want a Red Rider BB gun. And of course the response is, if you know the movie, what? You sh there you go, we're on the same page, I love it. But he's obsessed with this thing. That's all he can think about. That's all he can talk about. That's all that he wants. That's kind of the same idea here. I want you to think about this stuff. I want you to, to in your heart and in your mind, I want you to settle your, the affections of your heart. I want you to settle your thoughts on these traits because when you do these things, it will bring peace of God into your life. I want you to settle upon these things. Now, the question that I wanted to know is, well, why does it really matter? Why does it matter what I think about? Shouldn't faith just be trusting in what Jesus did? Does it matter what then I think about and what I set the affections of my heart upon? Well, it does. And it does for a couple of reasons why, and why thinking matters. One of the reasons is that our natural bent is to think about the opposite. Our natural bent, our sinful state, is to not to think about what is good, noble, honorable, and lovely. Our natural bent is to think about the opposite of these things. By, God, by the sin nature within our lives, that's what totally and completely separates us from God. We are naturally drawn to, to criticism. We are naturally drawn to, uh, to ugly speech. We're naturally drawn to that which is impure. We are naturally, by our sin nature, drawn to everything that God is against. And if you just think about it for a moment in your life, when you, times when you've not been walking with the Lord, when you've not sought the Lord, that's kind of the direction you went. It doesn't take much encouragement to, some, to have someone say something negative about something. We do that pretty easily. It takes great grace and the Spirit of God at work in our lives to think about something else. We naturally think this way. Also, another reason why thinking like this matters is we easily get overwhelmed and don't know what to think. We have so much information coming at us a thousand different directions. I came across these, these statistics, which I found just, just mind-blowing as with all the information that we're bombarded with. Did you, did you know that there are 60 hours, 60 hours of video loaded to YouTube every 60 seconds? 60 hours. There's no way anybody can watch all of it on YouTube at one time, although my kids are trying and I'm trying to. We can never watch everything that's on YouTube. Did you know that when um, worldwide, there are 1.47 billion people log into Facebook every day. There are 30 billion pieces of content shared every single month. Jeff Nunberg, who is a linguist and researcher at UC Berkeley in an article claim, makes this claim. He says, a copy of the Daily New York Times contains more information than the average 17th century Englishman encountered in a lifetime. We are constantly bombarded by information. And forget just information that we just don't know what to think about and how to process. Just the things that come into our own lives can be overwhelming. This event is happening to me. I don't know what to think about it. These, these things are happening in my family. I don't know how to feel about these things. I'm overwhelmed by all the circumstances in my life, places I have to go, the expectations I need to meet, things that people want me to do that I don't want to do, but I'm going to do because I love them anyways. I don't know what to do about all these things. We get overwhelmed by information and by emotion. Well, how can we respond to these things? This is why the Lord tells us to think upon these things rather than what overwhelms us. 
We're bombarded by information. We, we naturally think the opposite. But these thinking like this also matters because of regret. Because of regret in our lives. When we make decisions, those simple decisions even, and later we come to regret the decision that we made. You know those simple decisions. Well, I, I bought that shirt and I should have bought that one. I bought a Ford and really I probably should have bought a Chevy or a Toyota. You know, I, I made these, these simple decisions and I'm, but I'm regretting the thing that I did. Uh, we all have different levels of regret in our lives. And, and some of the regret in our lives is not sinful. We need to understand that. Just because you're regretting something doesn't necessarily mean that you've sinned. And I was thinking about this uh, years and years ago. Um, and be, you, probably, oh, goodness. I don't know how long ago it was. But I had this uh, funeral that I, did, that I officiated. And, and it was for a believer. A gentleman in the church, I'd known him for a couple months. We'd come to this church, only been there for a short time, gotten to know this guy, I really enjoyed him. And the Lord decided it was time for him to come home and he came home. And so I was asked to do the funeral, honored to do, con conduct the funeral and preach through the message and read the obituary, did the graveside, did everything that was, was supposed to do. And later at the family fellowship meal, which Baptists love having fellowship meals, and we do that well here at the church. I wanna commend everyone who does that. We do that awesome here at the church. But we're at the fellowship meal and one of the, uh, the kids come up to me and said, hey, just want you to know, we loved your message, we appreciated your words, but you pronounced his name wrong. The whole time. Now, now to, I wanna defend myself on this because I've been calling the man this name for months. Every time I see him, say, hey, 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 how are you doing? I'm great. I talk to other people in the church. How's this guy doing? Oh, he's doing fine. Nobody corrected me for months that I was pronouncing this guy's name wrong. But I regret that. And now every time I do a funeral, I make sure, hey, here's a name. How do you pronounce this name? <laughs> I'm not sure I get it right. But we all have things like that in our lives, things that, decisions that we made, action we've taken that we've regretted. Some of those regrets are even bigger. The man who was on a, left his happily, happy marriage, or was married for decades and was on a way in a convention and all of a sudden he had decided to have an affair while he was there. Came home, confessed it to his wife, confessed it to his family. They worked, they restored, she forgave him. Years and years later, every time he looks at himself in the mirror, all he says is, I had an affair. I'm an adulterer. He's living under that regret. We think of those, those men and those women who've, been, who've just been ingrained within their lives that you have to go here, you have to do these things, you have to do these certain things, you must work hard. If you don't, you're not accepted, you're not good. And then as they get older, they find their energy level is changing. The physical level is changing. All of a sudden they can't do what they used to be able to do and now they regret it and they're living in this guilt. Regret is huge. It can ensnare us. I sat with a man years and years ago in that similar situation as I described. Had an affair, his wife forgave him, family was restored. God did an amazing work of grace in that family's life, but he could never forgive himself. And after she had passed away for years and years and years, he just sat and guilt because of what he did. Regret is huge. God does not want us to live in that state all the time. God does not want us to live in that state. He wants us here to think about things here so he might know his peace and his presence. We need to know these verses to stand firm in Jesus Christ, when we are overwhelmed with life as it comes at us a thousand miles an hour, when we live with the regrets of our decisions or indecisions, when we are just completely and overwhelmed with everything, we need to know what to think. Because thinking, when we begin to think on these things, it settles into our hearts, we set our affections on these things and it shows up in our actions and what we do. Well, what are these things? As we dwell on these things, we think hard on these things, look at these things, we just kind of walk through these together. Whatever is true, thankfully not, not, these things are not complicated in their understanding. Whatever is true, that is simply whatever is true. As believers who stand firm in Jesus, we value the truth, not because it's just the right thing to do, because, but because God is true. We tell the truth, we examine what is true. When something is flying at you, we ask the question, what about this is true? Because God is true. 
Josh McDowell tells the story of his daughter, Katie, and when they were in elementary, she was in elementary school, her classmates uh, decided to get onto their teacher's some object that her, their teacher had on their desk. And when the teacher went out of the room, they went and they pulled the object off the desk and they were passing it around in the classroom and somebody broke it. And they put it back on the desk before the teacher returned. And of course, when she came, she saw the broken item on the desk and began to ask the class, what happened here? Who broke this? And all the class is saying, no, we don't know, we don't know. It's amazing how we don't know shows up all the time. We don't know how that happened. We don't know who broke that. And she turned to Katie McDowell and said, how did this break? And she told her the truth. Her classmates scorned her, rejected her, all the things that you would imagine would happen in the playground that day. But her dad took her home when he found out about the situation that next morning before school took her out to breakfast, not only to praise her for telling the truth despite the pressure to give in and lie, but to have this question and this dialogue with her. And he writes this, he says, I asked her after telling her how proud I was, why lying is wrong. She says, because the Bible says it's wrong. Yes, but why does the Bible say it's wrong? Because God commanded it. Why did God command it? And she looked at me as though I asked the question in a foreign language. And finally, she just answered, I don't know. And I took her hands in mine and locked eyes with her because I wanted to be sure she understood and remembered this. I said to her, because God is truth. Truth comes from his nature and whatever is contrary to God's nature is sin. Whatever is true is of the Lord and we set our hearts, set our minds on these things. And so when you're thinking of all these things bombarding at you, you'll be able to filter these out and say, what about this is true? And that is where God is at. What about this is true? And he goes on, whatever is honorable, whatever is inspiring, whatever it is that gives honor to another. And if you begin to think about the TV and the films and the music that just elevates dysfunction in our society and say this dysfunction, this, this obnoxious behavior is, is normal. They celebrate what is dishonorable. To be people of God, to stand firm on Christ, we say whatever is honorable, we're going to think about, we're going to dwell upon, we're going to interpret and settle into our hearts. He thinks whatever is just, whatever is right, whatever is right in this situation, what can I celebrate that is being done right and justly? You think of whatever it is that's coming at you. What about this is true? What about this is honorable? What about this is just? And perhaps if you're able to say there's injustice here, maybe the Lord of peace and the God of great strength is calling you to act justly into an unjust situation. Whatever then, as he continues on, whatever is, is pure. Now, purity is not a word we use very often. Well, I don't think I can remember hearing that very, very much uh, recently. Uh, it's, not, it's a word, though, that we need to introduce into our vocabulary. And dwelling on whatever is pure, thinking about whatever is pure is a reminder that the precious gifts of God have been distorted by sin. Blessed are the pure in heart, Jesus says, for they will see God. You see, you, you cannot see God at work in your life and at work through your life when you're filling your life with what is impure what is was distorted from what God has given you. Now, this is a good question to ask yourself as you begin to pull up your phone and surf the internet. And this is a site I'm about to go to, Pure. Would God be honored by it? And here's the thing that, that has happened. When we begin to invite things into our lives that are not honorable, not just, not pure, we don't stand firm in Jesus Christ. We get knocked around and unstable. And God is calling us here to set our minds, set the affections of our heart on what is pure. He goes on, whatever is lovely. Literally, those things that move us towards love. Those things that move us towards acting in love. 
those things that are, are beautiful, those things that, that are just inspiring. If, if you think of the world around us, we've been looking at all kinds of photos from all, all across the world. The National Geographic is famous for all the photos from the ends of the earth, of mountains and of, of insects and animals and just things you just look at and just go, wow. God didn't have to do that. He could have created the world just a concrete, flat rock jungle. He didn't have to create mountains that reach to the heaven. He didn't have to create sunrises and sunsets that catch you and take your breath away. He didn't have to do these things. But when we begin to think about whatever is lovely that God has created, whatever is inspiring, whatever is just all catching, then we also then are moved towards acting in love towards each other. I mean, think about this a fantastic sunset you see. What do you want to do? You want to get somebody to share that with. Look at this. Share this with me. That's what it means to love. I want to invite you into this moment with me. Whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, those things that wow us, those things that are to be celebrated and, and not condemning others. When's, when is the last time, just thinking through these verses, when is the last time you celebrated somebody just because they did something amazing or just because they showed up? Hey, I appreciate you. Thank you for being here. I'm so glad God has brought you into my life. You matter because you matter to God and you matter to me. You did that thing and you don't know it, but that thing meant a lot to me. And I just want to thank you for doing that. When we begin to celebrate in, in, in awe and wonder and being commendable and sharing and celebrating what other people have done and what is worth celebrating, it changes the way we begin to think about the world around us. Now, all of a sudden, all those horrible things that come at us, they don't seem quite so horrible because there's lots of things worth celebrating. Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is honorable, whatever is commendable, think about these things. And then he, he gets this, this last phrase in here, if there is anything worthy of praise, anything worthy of praise. You know what we need to do? We need to receive this in several ways. One way we need to receive this is very proactive. And what I mean by that is this. We need to be looking for things that are praiseworthy in our lives. If we want to stand firm in Jesus Christ and thinking about these things, because we think about these things, it settles in our hearts, and it settles in our hearts, comes out in our hands. We need to be looking for things to be praising the Lord for. God, thank you for this thing. Thank you for the rain. We need it. Thank you for the snow we're going to get later this year. It's going to make great Christmas card pictures. Thank you for allergies because the flowers are fantastic. We praise the Lord for these things. We need to be thinking ahead. What do I need to thank God for? Because here, here's what happens. When we take, this is why these verses are so powerful. When we take all of these traits that the Lord has handed down to us and we set our minds on these things, we set our affections on these things, then it begin, they become weapons they become spiritual weapons against the enemy who wants to, to crush us. The enemy who says there is nothing in this war life worth praising, we can say, yes, there is, because look at all that God has done. These become spiritual weapons. Remember, God is concerned about your spiritual state and he's concerned about your spiritual condition. The spiritual state is whether you know him through Jesus Christ. Your spiritual condition is if you're walking with him, standing firm in Jesus Christ. We stand firm in Jesus Christ by thinking about these things. We dwell on them. But then notice also here as we kind of, kind of wrap this up a little bit, and I do mean finally by finally. He says, practice these things. Practice these things. I, I want you to not only to think about these things, set your minds, set your heart's affections on these things, but then I want you to practice some stuff. He says, all the things that you've seen, all the things that you were taught, 
all the things that you saw me do my, by my personal instruction and my personal example. I want you to do these things. See, these things he phrases here, he says, you have you've heard and you've received. Received draws us back to 1 Corinthians 15 where Paul says, everything that I've heard, uh, everything I've received, I've now passed on to you. In other words, I've taught you what the word of God says. I've taught you who Jesus is. I've taught you what it means to follow after him. I've taught you how from the beginning of Genesis 1-1 all the way to the end of Revelation, which you didn't have at the time, I've taught you everything that it is to know Jesus. You've received these things. So it's not that you're, you're ignorant, not that you're uninformed, not that you just don't know. You've heard, you've received, and you've seen my example. You've seen me practice these things. You've seen me model these things. Here's, here's what I think this principle is for us. We have certain things we set our hearts on, set our minds on so we might stand firm in Jesus Christ. But when we begin to practice these things, we begin to do these things, we begin to act on these things, we begin to see our faith grow in ways we couldn't have even imagined. Lord, I, I'm trusting you. I'm looking at this situation. I'm trying to find what is right. I'm trying to find what is true. I'm trying to find what is pure. And I'm going to act on what is pure. I'm going to act in what is right. And I'm going to act in what is true. All these other messages are coming my way. I'm hearing all these things. I'm bombarded by all these things. But I'm going to focus on what is true. I'm going to practice what is right. I'm going to practice what is pure. I will not set, my, set anything worthless before my eyes, Job tells us. I will do all these things to stand firm in Jesus Christ because you saved me, you rescued me from sin, you transferred my life from the domain of darkness into the kingdom of the Son. I now have a new identity. I am a new person in Jesus Christ. And because I have been saved, I am now living this way and celebrating all the things that you have done all the ways that you've blessed me, all the ways you cared for me, all the ways that you've, you've put in my life, what is true, what is right, what is honorable, what is commendable, what is lovely, what is pure, I am doing these things. And we begin to do these things knowing God by his amazing grace has rescued us from sin and God by his amazing grace has given us the ability to set our heart, to set our minds on these things. We then have the promise at the end of these verses, the peace of God in our lives. I don't know about you, but that's what I want. These verses are powerful if you apply them. If you live them out. I know in my own life that I have seen God work and change my heart and change the way I've looked at circumstances, change the way I felt about a situation when I began to take it and run it through these filters. What about this is true? What about this is pure? What about this is lovely? What about this is commendable? What about this is honorable? What about this is worthy to be praised? And when that filter is applied, it helps my decisions, it helps my, my, what I do and how I live and helps me love the people in my life the way that God would have me. Because I guarantee that if you do the opposite of these things, you will not be experiencing the peace of God. If you seek out what is a false, not true. If you seek out what is dishonorable, not honorable. If you seek out what is unknowable, if that's even a word, and not noble. If you seek out anything that is worth criticizing and condemning instead of praiseworthy, you will not be standing firm in Christ. You will not experience the peace of God in your life. And my greatest desire for you this morning is that you know that you know that you know that your spiritual condition is saved. You've been rescued from sin. You have the fixed hope of heaven before you. You know that every sin, everything you've ever done, done is gone because in Christ you are a brand new creation. You know that you know that you know and that you're walking with the Lord and experiencing his peace as he changes the way you think changes what you set the affections of your heart on and changes what you do. Because what we set our minds on grows within our heart and comes out in our hands. 
What about you this morning? Have you been bombarded by life? You have decisions that you need to make that you don't know what to make? You have people asking you to do certain things that you don't want to go? you are inviting things into your life that are derailing you and, and, and causing you to be unstable and unsteady and rather firm in Christ? Is the peace of God absent in your life? Because I can promise you, no matter what is happening in your life, when we apply these filters, you will know God's peace. The situation may not be good, but God's peace is always good. What about you this morning? Where have you set your affections today? What will you set your affections on this afternoon, tomorrow, and the day to come? So here's, here's my challenge to us all. Take these verses graft them into your heart, chisel them into your mind, write them onto your, your postcard and stick them into your, your mirror or the, the, over the speedometer of your, of your dashboard. Whatever you need to do, put them on the, the home screen of your phone. And throughout this week, look at these verses. And Lord, help me to filter my life, my day through these verses. And I guarantee you, that this time next week, life will drastically change. Your outlook, your demeanor, the condition of your heart will change. Do you know the Lord today? Maybe God's led you here today to hear him, his voice and confess him as savior. How is God moving in you this morning? Would you stand with me as we pray and Enrico comes and lead us in a responsive singing?